The other two will follow right at the end of the briefing. We just got a little bit behind this morning because of some last minute changes. Speaking of which, um, if you saw on the program, we had uh, five speakers scheduled. The fifth speaker has withdrawn. Um, he's here, but uh, he's had some last minute questions about whether his result really is, uh, is gonna hold up, and so he's decided better not to publicize it uh, until he's got that all resolved, and I think that's the right approach. Um, it's better for all of us. Um, so, in case this is your first briefing at a AAS meeting, uh, the way we do it is I will introduce all the panelists and let you know what they're going to be talking about, and then they will each present in turn, and then at the end of all of the presentations, we'll do the Q&A. We usually start here in the room, and then if there are questions piling up online, we'll go to those for a while, and if we have time, we'll come back. All right? Uh, okay. I think that is it. All right. So uh, today... We have, uh, well, it was originally entitled Exoplanets, Flare Stars, and a Crab, but we lost our crab. So it's Exoplanets and Flare Stars, the Flare Stars being Kepler stars, and you all know the Kepler missions. So it's all, it's all exoplanet and host star related now. Um, it used to be the case that every AAS meeting featured at least one, sometimes multiple briefings on black holes. Now um, exoplanets have taken over. Uh, there's always at least one briefing on exoplanets, so I think we have exoplanets in another one as well. So, um, but it won't be long uh, before we have more black holes, as you know, because black holes are now really, really hot again. Um, so the first speakers will be a tag team, uh, Christopher Johns Krull from Rice University, my alma mater, and Lisa Prado. Prado? Prado? One. Which one do you use? I use both. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Lisa Prado slash Prado from Lowell Observatory. They're going to talk about the youngest hot Jupiter directly detected, yielding clues to planet formation. Then we're going to switch to Edward Sweeterman from the University of California at Riverside, speaking about there being a limited habitable zone for complex life. And finally, Yuta Natsu from Kyoto University and also the University of Colorado in Boulder will ask the question and hopefully answer it, do Kepler superflare stars really include slowly rotating sun-like stars? And if so, what's the implication? And so with that, I'll turn it over to Chris Johns Krull. No, actually, Lisa's gonna start, so we'll go with Lisa first. Okay, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk about this work. This is a project, um, the paper is, the lead author is Laura Flagg, she's a PhD student at Rice University who couldn't be at the meeting, so Chris and I are doing the presentation. We began this project uh, 15 years ago, roughly, to look for the youngest exoplanets because we know planets exist around other stars, but we don't know exactly how they form and evolve. And so that's an outstanding question that's very important. So just to give a little refresher on how stars form in that, and the top left, there's a figure of a star-forming region, an image of a star-forming region. Those dark, globulous clouds sort of up at the top are where stars form in the, in the very cold cores. The gas and dust uh, collapses, it's mostly gas, and it gets so hot and high pressure in the core that you have the onset of, of star formation, and eventually the, it's so dense and hot that the thermonuclear reactions turn on and blows away the cloud. You can sort of see some of the reddish stars are poking out of these cores already. Uh, around these young stars are the remnant material from the formation, these disks, and in these disks, planets form and evolve, and we're trying to figure out how. Some of the earliest planet uh, discoveries, exoplanet discoveries, were uh, observed and confirmed um, were of very hot Jupiters, right? These planets that are extremely close to the parent star. So you can see this little solar system figure on the top right that shows our configuration of planets and these, these exoplanets that were discovered in the last 20, 25 years were found to be very, very close. So in the lower right hand, you see an image of the sun taken from Jupiter. And if you look at these hot Jupiters, they're right up against their stars. Their periods are days. So we were sensitive to hot Jupiters in our survey. So 
<clears throat> this just shows a little movie in the top left of a planet and a star orbiting their sort of common center of mass. The star is much, much, much brighter, much, much more massive. It's very hard to see the planet. So we made our, our, our first uh, program, our first work in this program was with the McDonald Observatory 2.7 meter Harlan J. Smith telescope in the lower left there. And we did optical high resolution spectroscopy. And you can see on the upper right, there's a little diagram of what we see. If we keep observing the system over and over and again, we see that the, <clears throat> the star's uh, spectrum shifts back and forth as its Doppler shifted. So we can follow the motion of the star. We know that it's we're orbiting a planet if that motion keeps changing regularly like this. So uh, uh, later observations, we also used the Discovery Channel telescope in the lower right there. It's Lowell Observatory's 4.3 meter telescope. Uh, you see, this is the stuff we published in the plot we published in 2016, looking at radial velocity on the y-axis and time or phase on the x-axis. And so you see from many different instruments and telescopes, both optical and infrared, we could see the, the modulation of the star, indicating there was a planet there. There's a little artist conception below that showing a planet around a classical Tetari star, which is what CI Tau is. It's got a disk. It's actively accreting material from the disk onto the star. There's a sort of repetitive cartoons there on the right, again, illustrating the way the, the star and the planet orbit their common center. So we were actually able to see the motion of the star. We inferred there was a planet there, and we published that three years ago. Oh, thank you. And so what we did next was try and look directly to see if we could find the planet. When we're taking a spectrum of the star, we're taking a spectrum of the star and the planet simultaneously. So again, you see in the left-hand diagram the spectral lines of the star. And in the way this is shown, time is running down, and the dark lines are the spectral lines from the star. Now, they are moving back and forth, but just a little bit. On this scale, you can't see that motion. The planet, because it's moving in a bigger circle in the same amount of time, its lines are shown uh, schematically in those white diagrams, and so they're moving back and forth a lot. <clears throat> and so if we could see that, we could directly measure uh, some things about the planet. Uh, but again, it's much, much fainter than the star. So we need to be able to subtract the starlight to remove all the spectral lines from the star. And again, the signal from the planet is very faint. So what we try to do is add up. We try and straighten out those S waves of those white lines, the lines from the planet, so that we could add them all up and make the signal stronger and stronger. We don't know exactly how big that S wave is. So that was one of the things that we were varying in our study. If it's a very massive planet, that white S wave is relatively small. If it's a very light planet, that white S wave is very big. And so that's what we were looking for. That's what we were trying to test. So this diagram is kind of complicated. I won't try to explain all about it. But shown on the x-axis is uh, a representation of velocity position. And uh, it is showing us the, the actual bulk position of the whole star and planet together. And we know what that is very well. On the y-axis, what we're doing is varying the size of that S wave. At the bottom of the, of the y-axis, the S wave is very, very small. On the top of it, the S wave is very, very big. And what you see uh, kind of uh, halfway, uh, about 2 thirds of the way up in the middle, is a white peak. And that is when everything lines up and we actually detect the spectrum of the planet. These are uh, carbon monoxide lines. These are CO lines in the infrared. And so we've actually now finally detected directly the spectrum of the planet. It's much, much fainter, almost 300 times fainter than the star, uh, but it's there. And so that allows us to both measure the mass and the brightness of the planet, and that lets us learn something about how planets form. On this diagram, you see as a function of age on the x-axis, starting at 1 million years on the left, going out to a billion years on the right, the sun is even further off to the right. It's off scale on this. These are different models of how people think planets form. And at very old ages, they all converge. You can't tell the difference for any given model. But at very difference, <clears throat> the so-called hot start models are the red ones near the top. The so-called cold start ones are the blue ones near the bottom. And since we're able to actually measure the mass and brightness of this planet, we can put it on this diagram. And it lands at this particular position, shown by the little uh, diagram of Jupiter. Uh, we infer a mass of about 12 Jupiter masses. It's about 2 million years old. And it matches up pretty well with the so-called hot start models, a certain class of, of planet formation models. It may actually be a little bit too bright. 
So <clears throat> the, the exciting thing about this is we're able to actually put a planet in this diagram and we're starting to learn something about how uh, this planet and other planets form. So we're actually now online on the archive and that'll be shown in the press release as well. And we're done. Hello, uh, my name is Edward Swederman. Thank you for the privilege of speaking to you today. I'm here to present on a, a paper that was just published this morning called A Limited Habitable Zone for Complex Life. And the question we aim to answer with this study is, uh, who is the habitable zone habitable for? And what regions of the habitable zone could animal-like and human-like uh, life exist within? Um, so just as a little bit of background, the habitable zone is defined as a region around a star where a planet with the right atmospheric composition could maintain surface liquid water, liquid water being a key requirement for life, and also um, an opportunity to see gases evolved from an ocean in the, uh, potentially in, in the atmosphere of an exoplanet with future observatories. Uh, the habitable zone has different uh, uh, sizes depending on the host star and its temperature. Um, there are multiple definitions of the habitable zone, but the most common one requires uh, greenhouse warming by carbon dioxide. Um, and a planet must have greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide to be habitable. However, the further the planet is away from a star, the more carbon dioxide is required for a planet to remain unfrozen. And for the outer edge of the habitable zone, that amount of CO2 is actually 10,000 times the CO2 found in Earth's atmosphere today. Very high CO2 is potentially very uh, uh, toxic and deleterious to complex forms of life, particularly humans, animals, uh, we know of today on Earth. So the aim of our study was to use a, photo, uh, a comp computational climate model to calculate the minimum amount of CO2 required at different regions in the habitable zone for a planet to remain unfrozen. And this plot summarizes um, our results with contextual uh, information about known planets in the habitable zone provided. So the blue zone shows where carbon dioxide is below 1% um, to maintain a minimum temperature of zero degrees Celsius, freezing. And in distance terms, that is only about one third of the habitable zone, or less than 20% of the habitable zone. For 10% CO2, uh, an a, amount of CO2 that would be incredibly toxic to humans um, in, in a short time scale, the habitable zone is only one third um, as wide. Not only did we look at carbon dioxide, we looked at a different gas called carbon monoxide. So carbon monoxide is poisonous to many forms of oxygen breathing life because it binds to the hemoglobin in, in blood and prevents the transport of oxygen. In our atmosphere, ultra, ultraviolet radiation from the sun mediates destruction of carbon monoxide on short time scales. So there's uh, little of it in our atmosphere. But the chemistry of planetary atmospheres is dependent on the UV spectrum of the star, which will change depending on the type of star the planet orbits. Um, we used a photochemical model that can accurately reproduce the chemistry in our own atmosphere. And the only thing we changed was the type of star that planet was orbiting. So effectively, we placed the Earth in the habitable zone at different types of stars, including uh, lower temperature m dwarf stars, which are the most common types of stars in the galaxy. m dwarfs have a lower amount of the near-UV radiation that mediates the chemistry that destroys um, gases like carbon monoxide. And we find that an Earth twin in the habitable zone of an M-type star would promote um, toxic abundances of, of carbon monoxide for complex life that relies on um, low, low CO abundances. So this figure uh, summarizes our results. It shows a safe zone is the blue area in the plot where we could imagine diverse ecosystems like are present on our Earth where there would be neither uh, CO2 that was too high or carbon monoxide that was too high. In the outer regions of the habitable zone, um, a certain amount of CO2 is required uh, for greenhouse warming um, that would be toxic for advanced forms of life. And around lower temperature stars, um, toxic gases like carbon monoxide are favored to build up. So in summary, uh, to have non-freezing temperatures, rocky planets in the outer habitable zone require CO2 levels that are high enough to be deleterious to complex forms of life. Um, m dwarf stars, uh, plant, planets orbiting in the habitable zone of m dwarf stars could have toxic abundances of carbon monoxide. Our results inform the possible distribution of complex life in the universe. 
uh, suggesting that the Hadwell zone location um, and the type of star you're orbiting is really important for constraining this. And the numerical um, boundaries that we've calculated um, could help optimize the search for truly Earth-like exoplanets um, and their associated biosignatures and technosignatures. Thank you. Okay. Hello, my name is Yuta Notsu from, uh, from University of Colorado and the National Solar Observatory, same place at Boulder. And I'm also previously at Kyoto University, Japan. In this talk, I will talk about uh, uh, the title, Do Kepler Superflusters Really Include Slowly Rotating Sunlight Stars or Not? Uh, collaborators are them from NOJ University of Hyogo and the and University of Washington and Kyoto University and CU Boulder. So first, as an introduction, I started my talk with solar flares. Uh, uh, solar flare is a magnetic energy release and uh, shows a strong intensity enhancement of X-ray or UV or optical enhancements like the movies in the left panel. And not only uh, showing the high intensity or high bolometric emissions, uh, they also show, uh, solar flares also show uh, large mass ejections and mass ejections, when mass ejections uh, collide with the Earth, it can uh, cause uh, severe uh, impacts like uh, magnetic storms. And uh, some, for example, there are some, there are large impacts on the transformer in the past solar flares. So there are large impacts for on Earth or society from large solar flares. But if we see the stars, young rapidly rotating stars or cool m dwarfs or binary stars are known to generate super flares. Super flares are flares much more energetic than usual solar flares. So there is a question, such super flares can occur on our sun or not? But we, maybe we can expect these super flares are rare events because we don't experience in these recent hundred years. So try, uh, in order to detect such rare events, we use the Kepler Space Telescope. Kepler Space Telescope is very famous for searching for exoplanets using transit method. In the panel in the, in the upper right, upper right in the upper right panel, uh, Kepler uh, detected a large number of stellar brightness of large number of stars and detect exoplanet transit. But this is also useful for detecting flares. Flare has a small increase of stellar brightness. Kepler is good, has a good, very nice photometric, sorry, photometric precision. And also it continuously monitoring for four years of large number of targets, including 90,000 solar type stars. So Kepler searched uh, these, these large number of stars in this area. And like in, like in this movie, it's uh, mo continuously monitoring. So then we search flare-like events, sudden brightenings from Kepler public data. Then we discovered many stellar brightness increase corresponding to super flares. Uh, this figure is an example of Kepler light curve showing super flares. The stellar brightness changes uh, caused by stellar rotation, but there is uh, some sudden increase like this, or like, like this, can you show it? Yeah, with a duration of a few hours longer than few hours. And comparing the amplitude of stellar brightness caused by usual solar flares, uh, we, we can understand these events are caused by the large, uh, big flares, like super flares. So, and uh, after uh, several investigations, we, we can say that the Kepler results suggest sun-like stars slowly rotating, uh, inactive, uh, slowly rotating sun-like stars can also have super flares. This Kepler finding is very important, but there are several remaining questions to, fi to finally conclude super flares can occur on our sun. For example, we don't know, only from Kepler data, we don't know these flare stars are single or binary stars, or there are some possibility giant or other type of stars are included. And also we should check these super flare stars really slowly rotating or not. So then in this new study, uh, we conducted two, we used two methods. One is a spectroscopic follow-up observations using Apache 0.3.5 meter telescope. And the second is a stellar radius 
data from Gaia data release too. Gaia is a, is a mission measuring stellar distance. By, by measuring stellar distance, we, we can know stellar radius. I will explain the next, next slide. First, I briefly mentioned about the spectroscopic data. Uh, by already explained by him, uh, there is a spectral line in the spectroscopic data. And if we s carefully see the spectral line, the spectral line has a broadening caused by rotational modulations. If the star is rotating, uh, there is a wavelength shift caused by Doppler effect. So if the star is fastly rotating, the line profile becomes larger. By using this, we can measure rotation velocity. And we confirm there are superflare stars rotating as slow as the sun, like, like this. The sun is very slowly rotating. So we in superflares include slowly rotating stars. The next investigation is using Gaia data. U uh, using Gaia data, we can measure stellar radius. Uh, Gaia measures stellar distance, and uh, it can convert it to stellar radius. And this is the HR diagram of all Kepler data with in the horizontal axis the stellar temperature, in the horizontal vertical axis the stellar radius. And this is the main sequence and sub green line, the subgiant, and red is a red giant. And originally we found we detected superflares from originally we believed solar type stars, but we plotted original superflare stars from Kepler data. And the result is like this. So some of the Kepler superflare stars are found to be subgiant, but uh, still more about 60% are remained in a uh, main sequence area. So we classified again solar type stars by using these data, taking these uh, points on the black area. And finally, we updated statistical results and uh, uh, finally reached a more precise, more accurate uh, statistical uh, properties of superhero stars. Uh, please see the left panel first. Uh, this is the rotational velocity versus free energy of each superflare data. And as you can see, the upper limit of free energy has a correlation with rotation. So rapidly, young rapidly rotating stars has a superflare up to 10 to the 36 L, and this corresponds to the uh, 10,000 times larger than the largest solar flare. Largest solar flare is around here, 10 to the 32 L. But if the sun go, uh, become older and, and slowly rotating, uh, superflare does not reach to 10 to 36 L. It just, but even sun-like stars, slowly rotating stars, can have a superflare up to 10 to 34 L. In contrast, young rapidly rotating stars can have a superflare up to 10 to 36 L. And in the right panel, I, we compared a flare frequency distribution as a function of rotation period and there is a hundred times difference. So compare, uh, including these figures, we can say superflares up to hundred times larger than largest solar flare can occur on our slowly rotating sun-like star. And frequency is once in every 2,000 or 3,000 years. So this is a summary. We have found, uh, using Kepler data, we have, uh, sorry, we have found many superflares on many solar type stars. And follow-up spectroscopy observations and Gaia data release two data shows that these superflares that really include sun-like slowly rotating single dwarf stars. And free activity depends on stellar age or rotation period. Younger rapidly rotating stars have more frequent, more energetic flares, but sun even sun-like slowly rotating stars still have superflares uh, larger than 100 times larger than the largest solar flares, once every 2,000 to 3,000 years. That's all. Thank you very much. I'm surprised your last slide didn't say, be afraid, be very <laughs> afraid. <laughs> Thank you all very much uh, for keeping to time and for uh, giving us some very interesting presentations. Um, we're going to start with questions and answers here in the room. Um, Megan Watsky is the uh, public information officer for the Chandra X-Ray Center, and she's going to handle a roving mic. If you do have a question, raise your hand and wait for the mic, and then tell us who you are and who you're asking your question of. And then after we've uh, done a few questions in here, we'll check and see if we're getting any online. If you're on the webcast and you uh, have a question, please uh, cue that up in the text chat, which is only for accredited journalists, so that you know, the public, unfortunately, cannot <laughs> ask questions. Or maybe fortunately. <laughs> All right. Uh, questions here in the room? 
We'll start over here. Not an accredited journalist. I hope that's okay. That's okay. Uh, Scott Wolk, Center for Astrophysics. This is for Christopher Lisa. Uh, the planet you described is very young and already very close to its star. Did it form there or did it get there? Is this live? Okay. That's exactly what we're trying to answer. And because it's such a young system, it seems like it would be quite difficult to have the migration from formation further out in the disk to carry the planet in that quickly. There are some more current models, uh, I think by uh, Batika and Bodenheimer um, and other people have been working on this problem a little bit. So I think it is possible to migrate very quickly, but we're still addressing this if it's in situ formation or not. There's some evidence against the possibility of in situ formation simply because of the lack of enough material that close to the star. But um, there's also a possibility that maybe the planet started forming much, much earlier than we realized. So. That's a great question, and we hope to continue, continue to investigate it. Martin? Martin Ratcliffe for Freelance um, Utah. Uh -huh. Do we have any idea, I don't know what it is, what a 10 to the 34 Earth flare, super flare would do to an Earth-like atmosphere one AU away from its mm -hmm. star? Mm -hmm. and, it's, and presumably some of these flares would not be directed at mm -hmm. right at the planet, so you'll miss some of them. Once every two or three thousand years, what kind of evidence might there be that we've experienced one of those? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's yeah, it's an interesting but a difficult question. Yeah, of course, not all events attack the sun. So, but the, if the such uh, large event occurred, for example, thousand years ago, there might be a large aurora, or and uh, or the large particle events, and. Uh, such particle events can uh, effect on, uh, for example, carbon-14 uh, uh, volume in the atmosphere of the, of the Earth. And there are several uh, investigations for the, uh, investi to investigate the long-term or short-term changes of carbon-14. And uh, actually, there are some spiky events uh, about 1790s. I forgot, but there is a Nature paper in 2012. And uh, for example, such events can be a clue to investigate long-term solar activity and compare with stellar data. That's one, uh, sorry, uh, one answer. Yeah. I'd like to follow up, if I may. Um, so many of us have heard of this Carrington flare that occurred in 1859 and is supposedly like the biggest solar flare on record. Where does that fall in this uh, energy range that you've been describing? Is that up in that 10 to the 34 to 10, or 10 to the 33 Carrington even, or is it? Carrington flare is about 10 to the 32 L. So okay, so it's right at the bottom. 100 times the difference. Okay, yeah. okay. So we have no record of any flare as big as what you're describing yeah. so far, okay? Yep. Which means it's yet to come. Yep. Okay, yep. just wanted to be sure. Okay, more questions here in the room? Okay, we have one over here in the far end. Steve Lawrence, Hofstra University. My question is for Christopher or Lisa. Um, is your planet in a very low eccentricity orbit? Is there any evidence of a second orbiting body around the star? Um, so we actually do measure uh, a non-zero eccentricity. Our ability to constrain the eccentricity is not that good. So the error bars on that are pretty large. However, and that's when we look only at the stellar data. If we put in a zero eccentricity for the planet, we don't find the planet. So we have to have the non-zero eccentricity to find the planet. So we think it is actually fairly eccentric. Um, and what was the rest of your question? Was there a second planet in the system? Second planet. Um, so there is an ALMA image of the system that shows three additional planets much further out. Um, so this, this seems to be a full-fledged planetary system already. Those planets have masses of, of uh, Jupiter to Saturn masses based on the ALMA image. But again, they are 40, 60, 120 AU, uh, much, much further out. And just to add to that, those were published by Kathy Clark. Um, we worked with her in the ALMA data that was published in the fall of 2018. Follow? Okay, go ahead. Uh, so so the door is open for planet-planet encounters throwing this Jupiter in so close to the star? 
it, it, the door is open. One of the nice things about what we're able to do, since we can measure the velocity of the planet and the star simultaneously, we can set some uh, limits on the inclination of the planetary orbit, and it's pretty close to the inclination of the disk. So within the air bars, it's the same. So if it's planet-planet scattering that got this in, it scattered it into the disk as opposed to out of the disk. Any more questions here in the room? Do we have any online? Yes? Okay, we'll take a couple online then. All right, I have two questions for Edward from Rick Lovett, freelance. The first, um, in the famous Drake equation, are you finding that complex life is less likely than previously imagined due to a substantial decrease in possible habitable worlds? Um, yeah, so one of the, so the Drake equation is a famous uh, thought experiment for estimating the number of communicating civilizations in the galaxy. One of the uh, coefficients in the Drake equation is called F sub i, which is the fraction of planets that could develop intelligence. Um, and so the question is, uh, what is our best estimate of F sub i? And simply what we are saying is that um, it's not simply uh, based on the occurrence rate of planets in the, in the total habitable zone, um, that there are certain additional constraints um, for example, physical limits to how, mu how much greenhouse gases you need to keep the planet warm and therefore the chemical consequences of that in terms of in acidifying the ocean, and sort of phys physiological limitations for oxygen breathing organisms. And so F sub i is going to be a smaller number than that and perhaps um, substantially smaller. Okay, cool. A second question. Is it possible for life to evolve around these constraints that you've described? Specifically, are there potential oxygen carrying compounds like hemoglobin that do also bind to carbon monoxide and therefore wouldn't be poisoned by it? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so hemoglobin is the most efficient oxygen-carrying molecule we know of. Um, it's used by vertebrate animals, including humans. Um, but there are other less efficient forms of, of oxygen-carrying compounds like um, hemocyanin that you know, mollusks use. Um, and they would be less affected by this uh, problem, but they're less efficient at carrying oxygen around. Um, the, the, the sort of implications of our work are a little bit beyond just carbon monoxide as a gas. So for the same reasons that carbon monoxide can build up on these uh, planets orbiting quiescent um, M-dwarfs, um, so there are a lot of other problems with M-dwarfs besides what we've outlined, um, then um, um, uh, other gases that could be toxic also build up for the same reasons. And so there are multiple um, potential issues with, with, with the lower temperature of the photosphere of those stars. Anything else? Anybody else here in the room? Well, if this is your first AAS press conference, you don't realize that I always have questions. <laughs> and I haven't figured out yet if it's because I'm listening really carefully or if I'm just really thick. I don't know. Anyway, um, so my first question is uh, for Chris and Lisa. Um, is this a new technique being used for the first time, or is it a technique that, you know, that has been established before and is and you're using it for the first time and actually finding a planet or I'm just curious you know how new this is I mean when I was sitting there I was thinking I don't believe I've ever seen this particular kind of result before this is not a new technique it's been used for some of the um, older much older systems mm -hmm. so uh, is it HD 189733 has and, and a few others have had their, the planets have been directly detected. The virtue is with these hot Jupiters, they're so close to the parent star, their atmospheres are very hot. So you can actually, if you have extremely high signal to noise, you have very good data and you have many, many, you know, dozens. I mean, we have, we have 80 or 90 observations, mm -hmm. 80 or 90 spectra in the infrared to, to pull this out. So other people have been doing this with the, they're closer in the, the, the more nearby older, exoplanet host systems. And that really facilitates it because you can get extremely high signal noise. This is the first time this has been done with a T-Tauri star, a young star. And T-Tauri stars like CI Tau, which is a classical T-Tauri. So it has a, as I said, it has a, a substantial actively accreting circumstellar, primordial circumstellar disk. Uh, and that gives rise to tremendous variability. If you go look at the K2, it's, it, was, it was on silicon for K2. And you can see the light curve is, is, is pretty crazy. There's a lot of variability simply because of the activity that a T-Tauri star experiences. So it was a pretty, pretty impressive to us, even though we were doing the work. Um, and kudos to Laura Flagg for um, pulling this signal out 
and uh, our colleague Joe Lama also helped con contribute to that because he's been working with this technique. So it's, it's not a brand new technique, but it is the first time it's been applied to a very young star. And, and some people say young stars are 100 million years, 200 million years. For us, young is one or two million years, so it's, it's extremely young. And will the next generation of uh, extremely large telescopes be able to uh, do the same kind of work at farther and farther distances from the stars? Uh, that's a good question. <clears throat> I would think that the sensitivity of something like JWST, uh, which is also going to be in the infrared, is, is great. But as far as I know, the spectral resolution, I don't know how high... I, I was thinking, actually, of like the 30-meter ground-based telescopes oh. with adaptive optics. Yeah, I mean, those will collect a lot more light. So in theory, we get much higher signal to noise. So I expect so, but Chris well, has something to I add. I was just going to add to that. The, <clears throat> the instrument that we did this with is the Igrin spectrometer built by our uh, colleague, Dan Jaffe, at mm -hmm. University of Texas. Mm -hmm. He is building a very similar instrument um, for the GMT. Mm -hmm. uh, and we'll have much better collecting area, be able to look at much fainter things, much better signal to noise. So uh, yes, more of this should be able to be done even better uh, once that comes online. Okay, great. So I have a question for uh, Ed as well. Um, so you were concentrating on complex animal life and human life, that kind of thing. I'm, I'm curious, you know, whenever, uh, well, I'm curious what this, the effects of, of very large increases of carbon dioxide would have on plant life. Because you know, one could argue, especially if you were a plant, that there's a lot of complex plant yeah. life. Yeah. Well, you 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 um, hit on something. So uh, so the, so so there's a common assumption that increases in CO2 are good for plants because they use uh, CO2 as a substrate to generate oxygen. Well, that's Congress's uh, position. Right. Yeah. Uh, uh, but actually, it's not true. Um, if you if you look really? into the literature, um, the the effects are actually very complex. And I'm not an expert on this, but it's 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 not actually a um, a universally good thing for plants. And most of the studies have been done uh, considering only anthropogenic increases, which um, could be very deleterious to us, um, uh, our climate, um, the acidification of the ocean, um, um, and, and, and so forth, um, um, but do, do not even come close to the amount of carbon dioxide you'd expect in the outer edge of the Hadal zone, which is 10,000 times higher um, than what we have today. So any effect, uh, negative effect that we have on, for anthropogenic emissions um, which are not universally positive for even plants um, would be far worse um, in most of the habitable zone. So would you say when we go back to the Drake equation and we're thinking about that you know, fraction of planets that could potentially evolve intelligent life, are you, you know, in effect, shrinking the habitable zone for, for that purpose? Yes, in terms of estimating um, the distribution of complex life in the universe mm -hmm. and where we'd find biosignatures that are consistent with, with a planet that, that can evolve a diversity of ecosystems like we have on our, on our planet um, and potentially evolve intelligent life that could produce technosignatures, um, certainly microbial life would be fine in, in many of these places. And so we could search for spectroscopic signatures of simple life. Okay, and I think I already asked my question. Yeah, it was about the Carrington event. Uh, for Utah, so we're, we're good. Any other questions here in the room? Okay, we'll come back to Steve Lawrence over here. Where'd you go, Megan? Did she? Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, well, right, where am I? Yeah, right. Sorry, I didn't mean to spring one on you there. <laughs> Steve Lawrence, Hofstra University again. Uh, for Christopher or Lisa? Um, have you looked for a correlation between the orbital phase of the planet and the variability of the detour it's stuck? We have explored this a little bit, particularly with the K2 data, um, and nothing dramatic sticks out. As, as Lisa was saying, the K2 data is very complex. Um, we actually do pull out the rotation period of the star and we pull out the orbital period of the planet. The planet does seem to be modulating the accretion onto this star, mm. but there's a whole bunch of other stuff going on as well. Just to follow up on that, that we did publish that uh, grad student working with me and, and, uh, and Flagstaff, Lauren Biddle, had a paper on that a little over a year ago, and uh, she just was exploring the, and she's doing this with some of the other systems that we're looking at and that have K2 data and ALMA data, so that we know the inclination of the disk, the rotation period of the star, and we can put all these things together to, to identify the, the signal in the K2 data, which is the, the stellar rotation, 
compared to other very strong signals in the power spectra of, from the K2, which could be interactions between a planet and a disk. So we're only looking at, she's only looking at the systems that have disks. So it's sort of an exciting way to, to sort of probe potential other systems in addition to CI Tau that may have planet disk interactions. Anything else online? All right. Well then, we'll wrap it up. It's okay to wrap up a little early. Gives everybody more time to get some coffee and check out the posters. Um, so I'd like us all to thank our uh, four speakers again for their very nice presentation. <laughs> I'll also give a shout out to the public information officers who have uh, written press releases to support these presentations. Again, uh, one of them is already on the way, uh, on its way out via the AAS press list. The other two will be uh, sent just in a few minutes. Um, so, we have briefings uh, each morning and afternoon, Monday through Wednesday. This afternoon's briefing um, is called What's New Under the Sun? Uh, as the uh, banner graphic for our meeting suggests, this is a joint meeting not only with the American Astronomical Society, but its two uh, divisions, this, well, two of its six divisions, the Solar Physics Division and the Laboratory Astrophysics Division, and the papers that are being uh, highlighted this afternoon are being given in the Solar Physics Division meetings. So uh, please come back this afternoon to find out what's new under the sun. Um, we'll have more solar stuff through the rest of the week, uh, including predictions of the solar activity cycle, which now have increased urgency. <laughs> Though I don't think they're quite that high resolution. Okay, super. Well, thanks all very much. I hope to see you back here at 3 o'clock this afternoon, Central Time. Thank you.